All right, well, thank you guys for coming. Uh, yeah. Super excited to talk about this. Uh, my name is Tim Laptino. I'm the author of the book Art of Atari. And with me here is Steve Hendricks, who is one of the artists who worked originally in Atari and one of, really one of the people who's really influential and really helping develop the style of illustration that Atari used to sell not only the Atari 2600, but also some of the uh, APIC computers, and really like you know did a lot of work as well in coin op. So we're going to dig into that. We're going to look at some art. Um, but if you want to just like say a little bit about yourself. Sure. Um, the uh, Atari experience was pretty amazing. We're going to talk a little bit more about what it was like um, at Atari. Uh, I can say for one thing, it's an experience I'll never have again, working for a company, getting paid to do the amazing, fun stuff we got to do back then. The environment was super creative, and uh, I just love being there. Um, I continue to do, uh, you know, illustration work and design work, and, uh, something we won't talk about during our panel, but I also restore old cars, Chevys, mostly pickups, and uh, showing Tim one of the pickups I restored a couple of years ago. But anyhow, what a broad range of things. Well, there's a design tie-in, and I think that's an important thing. I think, for, you know, my interest uh, in this is obviously love the Atari, Atari games, you know, grew up with Atari, but really seeing this sort of art and design sort of blue line that goes through everything that, Atari, that the historical Atari did. You know, whether it was cabinet design or illustration or uh, industrial design in terms of the consoles, uh, or graphic design. You know, there's a through line. It's hard to get a, this is a thing that we really don't talk about a lot. You know, everyone talks about the programmers and the great games, and, you know, and that's legit. You know, if that, if, if those games aren't amazing, we're not here talking about them today, right? But there's definitely a set of sort of, you know, somewhat unsung heroes in terms of marketing and graphic design and illustration that uh, they really set the bar for, for great work, great marketing, and uh, in an, you know, an industry that was really in an infancy, and really decided, you know, helped sort of set the pattern for how things were going to be marketed. Think about games. What kind of boxes were they going to be in? You know, what size were cartridges going to be? Um, you know, what were you looking for when you looked at uh, a cartridge box in a video store or something like that, or Sears? You know, how were these things going to be displayed? Those were, all those questions were totally up for grabs. You know, and Atari, you know, they took things that they knew from other industries, whether it was, you know, the record industry or... Uh, movie posters or paperback books, and they took little bits of that and they sort of formed this thing that generally, you know, I mean, everything's moving sort of to digital downloads now, but up until very, very recently, this plan, it, things are still done this way. You know, people haven't deviated too much from that. I mean, you think about, you know, and I, I don't want to go too far down, you know, this rav trail, but you think about the Atari 2600 case. You open that thing up, it's mostly air. I mean, it's monstrous, right? You know, it does not have to be that big. It could have, you know, it could have been this size. It could have been almost the size of an A-track, you know, almost, but, you know, they really believe that you needed a physical and a substantial presence in the, you know, in the living room, and really thinking about making this something that fit in with the rest of your living room in terms of, you know, you've got your hi-fi system, you've got your record player, you know, great wood veneer, you've got, you know, got all your VCR, all these other things, and it want, that you wanted it to play well with everything else and fit in there, and look at today, I mean, sure, now we're talking about, you know, anodized aluminum, and, you know, Beautiful brush plastic that everything's all black with glowing, you know, glowing power switches. But it's all designed around that same big design idea, which is fitting in with the rest of your electronics in your living room. And I think it, it, you can't really understate the, the power of Atari in art design and illustration and how much they influenced everything that came after that. So it's kind of fun to have Steve here and to get sort of an inside picture into, you know, the illustration and this really specific part of it that really is pretty separate from the actual making of the games, but at the same time, it sort of, you know, dodges and weaves in and out of that process. So we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about that. But first, I mean, we're here, you know, it's a panel about the art of Atari, about Steve's art, so, like, I would be, you know, just totally derelict in my job if we didn't just start looking at some art. You know, and I'll apologize to you real quickly because, like, you know, everything's formatted for widescreen, most of the art is not widescreen, so apologizing me for all the bad cropping that I had to do, you know, to get this on the screen. It's okay. So, you know, like I said, you know, you, if you're here, you're sitting here, you know the story of, you know, Pong, of uh, Ted Dabney and Nolan Bushnell, and sort of how, you know, that was their second effort was Pong, and they really helped usher in, 
you know, what would become the arcade games and eventually the commercial video game industry. Um, you know, Pong is a big deal, but you all, as you see, you know, very quickly they started getting much more sophisticated about presentation and marketing and the way that games were going to be presented. You know, first you're talking about selling to, uh, you know, you're not talking about end consumers, but you're talking about actual, you know, people who run arcades and, you know, corner shops and things like that. That's a different audience, but as soon as they, tr you know, set their sights on this, you know, the, the living room, that's not my living room, uh, but it's a pretty awesome living room. Um, you know, as soon as they set their sights on, you know, bring things home, they had to start thinking about marketing. You know, they started thinking about how do you sell these games? How do you communicate in one instant, you know, the, the idea of playing this game? You know, and so if you're under 30 probably at this point, you know, this may be a weird thing to think about. You know, it's, you know, a lot of people say, oh, you know, I look at those boxes and that's a ripoff. It, the art's nothing like the game and it's false advertising. You know, and I, I think that's a, that's a retroactive way of thinking about it because, you know, when growing up, when we went to the, the game store, you saw that, you didn't know what that game was going to be like. And this artwork communicated the energy and the emotions and the feeling. And it really sort of, you know, it was almost like wayfinding. It sort of put you in this place, you know, hey, look, there's people batting a tennis ball. This is going to be a tennis game. Or, you know, look, at this is Othello or, um, you know, checkers even. And it really communicated for you a sense of time and place. And that sort of set the stage for this game experience because these games were new. This was cutting edge. It wasn't like, these graphics suck. You know, it very much so was, this was, this was the, the best stuff. You know, this was the cutting edge. And yes, they weren't the same as arcade games, but the fact that you could do anything on your TV was pretty amazing. And so I, I think that's an important thing to hold in your mind here to think about, you know, the, the brief, you know, in design, we talk about design briefs, right? You know, the brief that Steve and all the other illustrators had wasn't necessarily, make it look exactly like this ball that's actually a square, right? You know, the brief was capture the energy and the emotion and the excitement of this game and set the stage for it. You know? And I don't want to put more words in your mouth because I want to see, you know, is that actually true? But, um, you know, to go from something like the Atari 2600 and then, you know, and move that into actual packaging, right? You know, you guys were not the only ones doing this. You were working as part of a team, you know, with graphic designers, production designers, you know, there's art direction going on, some by you, some by other people, uh, to give you this, right, this full-on presentation of what, uh, you know, the public was going to see when they were going to, you know, either consider buying or buy a game or, you know, the 2600 itself. Um, and so, that, you know, I wrote a book about that, so I just have to say that. <laughs> Available in the gift shop. Um, so let's, let's talk about your team, uh, you know, people here, you know, who, were, who was on your team? What was this like on a day-to-day -day at Atari? Well, the head of our team was uh, George Opperman, who's uh, the one leaning on the table, the head of the table there, and he put together a pretty, pretty cool team of people. Um, this is Coinop, this is before we got into the consumer packaging, uh, but uh, he, was, he was really an inspirational person to work with and uh, super hard worker. And in case you didn't know where I was, I'm in the stripe. Sailor outfit. <laughs> Sailor outfit. <laughs> Actually, that was rug rugby shirts were like a big deal back then. So, <laughs> I started there back in 77 and it worked to uh, about 1982. And uh, uh, Roger Hector is um, um, next. And then Jim Arita, he and Jalt who was standing with the mustache next to George, they were the production artists who took our concepts and actually created all the silkscreen artwork for the arcade games. Amazing artists, and they had to work over a big light table. Some of our side panel graphics for the games could be up to 13 colors. So they had amberlith, and they had inking, they had all kinds of stuff that probably nobody even knows what that is anymore these days but all pen registered and, and everything. So they're bent over these um, big, giant light tables doing that work for us. Really amazing craftsman. And then Bob Flamani with the glasses, a uh, fantastic illustrator, did a lot of the titles. Um, and then Evelyn Cito um, was Evelyn Lynn back then. She actually worked for George um, in his design studio before he was um, hired by Atari. And he created the Atari logo and so forth. But 
Evelyn was a rarity. We didn't have a lot of female presence in um, our, our department in the early days. She was it. And um, we were right there adjacent to the industrial design team. So we had this great uh, relationship with them. And Roger actually was one of their, their top um, industrial designers. And then um, Jim Kelly, I just got to see him at a 45, I can't believe, 45 years <laughs> reunion, Atari coin up reunion just a couple weekends ago. And Jim's still doing good. Um, but both he and Bob were the ones who originally interviewed me and hired me. Um, they, they said, they told George to come in, you know. Um, it, was, it was really a fun team. They called me the kid. You can see I look so much younger than everybody else. Except maybe Jimmy. Um, Jimmy was very short. Um, <laughs> he, he probably was as old as the other guys, but you know, being um, uh, Japanese, he never showed his age. Uh, probably still looks just as young. But anyhow, it was really a fun team. You can see some of the great artwork uh, on the table there, and uh, a lot of cheesy, cheesy faces. They used me as a model for a bunch of stuff too, just because. I was gullible and, oh, sure, I'll do that. <laughs> and then we'll get to that. Right? Oh, we are, okay. <laughs> I haven't shown him the slide deck, so. Yeah. Anyhow. And there's, so there's this. So oh, there's no. you and the flower, you're you. Yeah, so uh, we had a lot of fun um, during lunch, a lot of times for breaks. We worked really hard, but we also had a lot of fun. And Jim Kelly was the consummate um, betting man. He bet on everything, whether it was darts or ping pong. And he used to be a track star when he was in high school. And one day he goes, hey, you know what? He knew that I worked out at lunch. I'd run, I'd jog. Um, I want to choose you to a, a, a race. And so the local park there, we had the great Atari race. And um, it's pretty funny. Do you have some of the other pictures of him? I Okay. To protect you, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> he arrives at the park with two of our more lovely beauties from um, the coin up department. Um, in arm and arm, he had a smoking jacket on. He had his sunglasses. He had a stogie, and it was hilarious. He goes, comes walking in, and he's got his his uh, helper who has his track shoes. He has his starting blocks, all that stuff. Needless to say, I beat the pants off him, but, you know, <laughs> and when I saw him a couple weekends ago, he says, uh, hey, you know what, we need to have a rematch, and he, had, he, he told me he had to sit down because his knees were hurting, so I, yeah, a great rematch. <laughs> he was joking, of course, but we had a lot of fun together. Let's talk about some of your art, you know, like, let's, let's talk about Defender, but and before we dig into sort of the details of this piece, what was the creative process like? You know, when you know, when you did you see a game right away? Was it finished? Was it in progress? Did you talk to the programmer? Like unspool that for us. I think the process um, really evolved, and um, because of my design background, um, I was actually an industrial designer in college. Um, it was key that I talked to the game designers because, like Tim mentioned earlier. We wouldn't even be talking about this stuff if it hadn't been for the game designers and the great gameplay that they developed. Um, so I wanted to find out what the game was all about. And you know, when I saw the actual game on the screen, I was a little bit underwhelmed. It's like, that's what it is? It's like, <laughs> oh my gosh, how do we communicate what this game's all about? So it was really key being able to talk to the game designers, find out what their inspiration was for the game, and how to communicate that in a way that people would go, this is awesome, I gotta buy this game. Um, so, you know, it really was important for us to try to capture what the game was all about. And uh, we went through uh, concepts, the concept sketches, uh, went through a process of review, and um, John Hayashi was actually my boss um, in the consumer group, and uh, we'd review them with him, and then it actually had to go before our president, who at the time was Mike Moon, and um, a great guy to work with, and I was telling Tim that this is the kind of person that's like the dream client, doesn't get in there trying to design it for you, um, and you know, I think he approved everything that we brought to him. But that was the process of getting approval. We went right to the top, 
and uh, with our concepts. And they were usually just sketch form. We didn't show color comps. And then the final painting had to be reviewed once again by each one of those folks. So um, most of the stuff I did was uh, acrylics and gouache. Once in a while I threw in um, airbrush. Um, but really, the person we really need to thank for the look, the original Atari look, was Cliff Spawn. And if you ever have a chance to get the book, or if you have it already, uh, you know, check out Cliff's work, because he's the one who right, created that look, and it was the Atari look that we were asked to kind of replicate with a lot of the pieces. Um, so um, he was very generous in sharing you know, some of his uh, tips on how he was painting it. And he actually had borrowed from some other artists that were well known in our area at the time. David Grove was a really well known artist out of San Francisco at the time. And uh, so the subtractive methods, very thin washes, wash over wash, and you know, you subtract, you know, the highlights and all that kind of stuff. So those were kind of the, the things that inspired this particular look. And as you've seen with all the stuff that you've been looking at, there is a lot of different looks that uh, eventually evolved. And it, a lot depended on the title. You know, something that was a little more playful, maybe a more cartoony look to it. And if it was uh, a licensed product, it you know, had to replicate more with the uh, license uh, owner requested, you know, whether it was Yours Revenge or, you know, uh, Pac-Man, whatever it might have been. So. so let's talk about, let's talk about Defender here. This yeah. is one of my favorite pieces and somebody's going to correct me out there from wrong about this. Bob Palero designed this or wrote the game, am I right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, right. Okay. If it's not, uh, um, so, you know, so, so you'd get a partially, you know, done game and you'd see, so you, would you get to play it? Before you did this, or would you just get an idea? You know, would you get a text description? Is the the um, developer would actually review it with you. So you'd sit um, down with yeah, you sit down and you would actually, you know, play the game, talk about you know different aspects of the game, what it was all about. And so, how would he talk um, about? I mean, would he say, okay, these guys are called this, and then you know, this is the goal? And I'm thinking, I mean, would he really flesh it out, or just say, hey, man, this is the gameplay. This is what I'm making. Yeah, in this particular case. Um, we didn't get into all the nuance. Some of the other games, it was more involved, but uh, this particular one, it was more of the concept. And rather than doing a montage illustration here, it was more of a, a scene, you know, kind of a mad dash for safety scene. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'd use friends and employees as models. And um, I got in San Francisco early one morning, no traffic, which was nuts out. No one was there. Um, and uh, no construction in this particular area. So, you know, a lot of reference of it, build models, and, you know, sometimes they look like actual things you might see in a movie. But, in um, any event, you know, it was pretty straightforward with this particular game. So, we had to kind of, you know, create this environment because they would not say, okay, this is downtown streets of San Francisco. It wouldn't be that specific, it's more generic. So when you're shooting, you, so you didn't you use models for reference. So you'd photograph yeah. models, mm -hmm. right? So you'd have people exactly. come in and say, oh, you know, you're from accounting, and come in, have them sit, and photograph them, have those developed, and you'd work off of those. They would use slides. slides. Use a slide projector. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a, a Maxwell Parrish, um, if you're familiar with his work, a uh, famous um, painter, illustrator, he, he used um, um, a form of a opaque projector um, he would shoot, reference, and project, and uh, um, it was something that developed. That, so that, so, so basically, um, you would, um, you know, take. Um, he would create a scene. In his case, we create scenes or models, um, actual, you know, like uh, uh, rocket models or a person. We'd set them, and, you know, create the lighting. You had to make it consistent. You now with the direction of lighting and so forth. But um, we'd use slides. In his case, he would use um, uh, a, uh, an image, a photographic image, and it would be projected, an opaque projector, up onto a, a drafting table or a wall, and then you sketch over that. It basically makes it a quick translation from concept to you know, final piece. Um, and. Uh, so you, you sketch all the details and 
a lot of times what we did with, with these pieces is we'd take our sketch and then we'd photograph our sketch because we'd cut it apart, we'd relay it out, and then we'd project the final sketch. So it would be kind of a road map of how, how we were going to render it. Um, so everybody worked differently. That was just a process that I used. And uh, um, Norman Rockwell, he uh, did the very same type of thing. Um, so basically, you kind of use photographic reference. You're not tracing it exactly. None of these people looked exactly like this, or these elements. So um, it was it's a similar process that commercial illustrators and uh, fine artists even use today. Most people can work. Fine artists, for instance, have the liberty of taking very much time to, you know, draw from life. So we did that a lot as well. But for this stuff, we had very tight deadlines. We couldn't sit around and, you know, draw from life because it's a little, a little more time consuming. And some of the stuff is just done, you know, out of our minds. Um, and uh, more of the cartooning stuff that I did when I was there um, was done in that fashion. Um, so, like I say, a lot of people were different ways. Yeah. So you guys also, you also built models as yeah. well? I mean, is that, did that seem like that, is that a luxury? I mean, in terms of like being able to like assemble your own models, light them, you know, on the tabletop and then photograph them and then, or that seemed like that's a much Well, a lot of times I do in my, on my spare time at night in my okay. shop at home. Um, because it was, you know, the degree of authenticity that I wanted. I wanted to make sure I get the lighting just right um, and things like that. Um, so again, you know, making sure the all the lighting um, and so forth was consistent throughout the whole piece as it would have to be with the single scene. Montage it wasn't as critical because you had different kinds of elements creating the scene. Yeah. Now talk about, you, you talked a little bit about this reductive thing, but maybe we can put it in non-artist speak. So. So that everybody knows, like when you talk about taking paint off and adding it, like in the background. I mean, this is an example. Can you, can you talk more about what, what that looked like? Sure. Um, if you saw the painting at the beginning, when I started, you go, "How in the heck he's going to do anything with that?" Because you're you're throwing down a lot of color, um, and there's a pencil sketch underneath. So it's kind of like where I'm working back towards is pulling out highlights and. I use a, a rag or a, a dry brush or a uh, brush that's been wet, even with lacquer thinner sometimes, because we have gesso underneath, so it really keeps you know, the color intensity. But you pull all the highlights out and kind of soften some of the edges, and so you're kind of scrubbing the paint away in right. some areas. So you're pulling it away to get yeah. the texture. Yeah. Yeah, and underneath that gesso actually has a texture thumb, so we would you know, create that that effect of your brush strokes. Yeah, and some of the stuff is just accidental, what happens when you're painting. <laughs> right, right, you get the happy accident. Yeah, yeah, so a lot of happy accidents. Let's talk about this one. This yeah, and that's actually, Jim Kelly was my model with that one for Night, night Driver, and uh, so I love cars and uh, race cars, and so we, Kind of created something just with uh, imagery from my morgue. And, uh, Talk about that because I don't even know if they know what a morgue is. Yeah. So back in the day, illustrators had what they call a morgue. Pre internet. Yeah, <laughs> pre internet. There's no, nothing. This was digital back then. Um, and uh, the reference material was key in putting ad illustrations and some of our other artwork together. You do clip art, you actually, you know cut stuff out of magazines and things like that and we put it into a file cabinet and everything was labeled. And I still, <laughs> I, I haven't used it for years, but uh, you know, having some of this imagery ready so you could put stuff together really quickly. And uh, so that was the morgue. And uh, it had everything from A to Z. So if I wanted to go and say, hey, you know what, I need this specific kind of race car and I need some reference for that and go and see look up race cars, find something that fits, mm -hmm. and then you use that as a basis for what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And, and the, the uh, IMSA series was something living in the Bay Area, Laguna Seca is really close by, so we would go to those races all the time. So that was that was kind of my my uh, interpretation of, of the uh, race car elements at that time. Why well, you captured it? I mean, I think the thing, I mean, who's played uh, Night Driver? 
right? I mean, what do you see? You see a lot of headlights. You know, I mean, that's a big part of that game, right? And uh, you know, some of this is just, you know, communicating the big, you know, the big parts of this. And this is done in a much, you know, more, you know, humanistic, you know, broader way. But you still, there's a total one-to-one, -one, you know, between this and the game. You know, and I would almost say it goes so far as to say, you see this first because you're going to see the box, you're going to see the manual, the cartridge, and then you're going to play that game. And you're sort of going to map what Steve did onto that game, even though, you know, if you're going to be, a, you know, real literal about it, there's a lot of red rectangles, you know, which are, you know, our taillights and things like that, you know, like, but, you know, you're going to map this sort of experience of saying, yeah, the sun's gone down, and, uh, you know, all the lights are on, and, uh, you know, that's going to inform part of that play. You know, which is, I think why this, this art is really important, not just from a sales perspective, but something that's going to jump off the, off the shelf at you, which is really important, right? I mean, that's like one of the uh, you know, big tenets of pack design is what I do in my day job. You know, we talk about how do you, know, you have those three seconds to grab someone's attention. So it's got to be a dynamic, you know, piece of, you know, imagery, a package that really, you know, has a movement of its own that's going to look like it's sort of leaping off the shelf to you. And then it also has to have the fidelity to the game in some fashion. And I think you can see a through line here with what uh, you know, he's doing. You look, you know, going off in the distance, you've got all these cars, you know, and their headlights and the things that are really standing out. And I think it does that. So, you know, so I think that's really successful. Uh, let's talk about, this is an amazing game. Somebody on the, I saw oh, someone. Hello. Yeah, I think that's so. That's Jim Kelly again. <laughs> <laughs> he was just a couple drafting tables away from me, so. He became my, my uh, go-to guy. He's got a great face, kind of uh, um, hot, no, what's his name? Um, no, Tim Curry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, think about uh, 007, and there was this, an actor, what was his name, guys? Sean Connery? Yeah, Sean Connery. I said, started to say Hans Conry. <laughs> That's not right. He was a comedian. German cousin. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so anyhow, this this was uh, done in a completely different fashion in terms of uh, you know the uh, components. I think you have that. Oh, you're right. I don't know why. I always thought it went, went the other way. Um, anyhow, <laughs> it's been a few years. So anyhow, you know, creating um, this more graphic approach to this piece was uh, really important, kind of drawing you into the, the gameplay. So here, in a sense, it kind of breaks the model for which a lot of the other pieces were done. Um, so, you know, we're bringing some of that gameplay actually into the, uh, the illustration. And, uh, well, it's interesting. This looks, I mean, this feels to me like, I mean, you know, this is just the sense that I get. I, it looked like he's pressing these electronic squares and they're like lit up, you know, they're sort of sitting up above, you know, they're, they're almost floating there. But they look like they've got an inner glow to them. I mean, was, you know, I mean, obviously when you, you play this game on screen, it's flat, you know, you've got, you know, different, you know, everything's glowing, it's on television. But, uh, you know, this almost feels almost like touch screen like. I mean, was that, was that your intention or are you just trying to make something graphic that, you know, communicates something? Um, that's, that's part of, uh, you know, the reason it went into it. I also wanted to give it a little bit more of a, uh, uh, a sense of, of wonder and wizardry, you know, with the little ray of light going to the, the key, obviously. That doesn't happen when you're really playing the game. Um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, and then the decision-making process, you know, it's a thinking game. So, you know, that was, that was the other uh, idea with the different... You know, shots of of Jim. Yeah. Well, that's a game I want to play. You know, I think, and I, of course, my my younger brother always beat me. You know, really <laughs> All right, let's talk about this. Is uh, soccer for the fifty two hundred? Yeah, in this one, um, there's some of these games we didn't really sit down with the game designers and tell me, you know, your concept behind this game. It's kind of obvious. It's all about playing soccer. So we tried to do something that was impactful and, you know, add some energy to it. And uh, so I, I think this, this was a guy that I worked with, too, that he used as a model. He did be really careful with a high-profile company like Atari. People always trying to sue, you know, this happens, you know, globally. But somebody's always trying to sue you because you use their likeness. And we actually got, even though it was employees, um, 
we got model release forms for them because uh, on Defender, Kathy, who's a friend of mine, was the model. Someone actually tried to sue us. Oh, you used my Lectus without my permission. All I had to do is send the model release to our legal team, uh, a copy of the slide, and I said, no. <laughs> this woman has nothing to stand on. So, anyhow, with this particular one, um, yeah, just something that uh, really had a lot of action and uh, good, kind of different, different uh, views and interaction, you know, with the ball and with the players. Let's talk about montage for a second, because obviously sure. you're doing this here, you know, and this is, I mean, this is something that if you opened up a magazine in, you know, the 19, in mid, late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s, you would have seen a ton of montage and like editorial illustration. But what is it, and why? Why did you use it, and why do we not see it anymore? I think one of the um, keys for montage illustration at the time is you're trying to encapsulate a lot of um, game concept in one image. So how do you do that? Montage was a really convenient way of kind of giving um, different perspective on the game. So you could either show um, various aspects of the gameplay or uh, different activities within the gameplay. So it made it much more interesting than just having, you know, a single image. Um, so the fact that it was also kind of a, a common uh, thing you might see in book cover, as well as movie posters. Movie posters used a lot of it and back well, in the day. Drew Struzan is a good example. Drew Struzan was, you know, one of the best, um, if not the best, of montage and his ability to capture likenesses. But yeah, that was kind of the, the way it was done. And you see it montage a little bit now, but it's all Photoshop and, uh, you know, probably a little simpler. Although I did see something pretty crazy the other day, um, probably a couple months ago, uh, that was like, whoa, it's starting to look really illustrative. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Like the, I think that all the promo stuff for Stranger Things is mm -hmm. all done in illustrative montage. Mm -hmm. and it's actually really done well mm -hmm. versus you see like an Avengers poster where it's clear that they've shot six people in totally different environments, none of the lighting matches, yeah. you know, all that kind of stuff. Now I've ruined this for all of you. <laughs> <laughs> look, look at an Avengers poster and you're like, oh, there's, you go, hey. there's, high, there's highlights on the side of Tony Stark's face, but on the Black Widow, they're over there. You can look at it and you be like, oh, that doesn't look right at all. You know, you may not be able to pick what it is, but you can tell there's something fakey about it. You know, and, but you guys worked really hard to make sure that that felt authentic, and if, you know, even if it wasn't to the letter of the law, you know, like it felt like it all worked within the context of the piece. Yeah, and designing it, it wasn't just throwing different images together, but designing in a way that it all kind of worked, worked together. And I love the image, by the way. <laughs> so here's a detail on this, I just think it's great, you can see the brush strokes, and you know, oftentimes you see little bits, uh, you know, right here on the soccer ball, there's like larger like splashes of ink. I mean, is that just, you just do that so you can just really get some energy out of it? Like here, you know, you got like larger bits, you know, not just tiny little strokes. Yeah, well, like I was saying earlier, a lot of times that stuff just happens because um, uh, we use workable fixative and it, it creates a resist so when you're putting water-based You said that in English, paint. so they know what that means. I know what that means. <laughs> uh, if you were to throw water on your car after you've waxed it, it bubbles up, there's like a resist basically, it doesn't lay flat or cheat off smoothly. Well, the same thing kind of happens when you're using a workable fixative and you put paint over it that's just water based, it just kind of floats on it and it will cause little openings in the paint. And sometimes it'll drip and sometimes it'll sink into the recesses of the gesso. So you get this really cool texture and you just, you just have to play with it a lot to get that to work for you. Otherwise, it just looks like a big mess. Um, so you didn't know you were going to art school this morning. <laughs> cool. Let's talk about this golf. Um, just real quick, let me ask you this, and like you can, you know, for all legal purposes, you can uh, disagree. You know, just say no to answer no to all these questions. Uh -huh. Is that Jack Nicholas? Is it the what's her name from uh, Caddyshack? Oh no. <laughs> uh, I would usually change everybody's faces, so it wasn't the actual people. But this actually was the second. Piece, the first one I threw away because I didn't like it. <laughs> I, did, I think it was the first piece I did really? in this style. So um, the, the first one is like I did. 
Well, I like this, and I, I like, I kind of had to crop some of this out, but like, you have sort of this, the swing, you know, there's a circle that's kind of, you know, encapsulating this thing and drawing your eye all the way around, you know, from the beginning here. Oh, yeah. And, uh, the you know, I like I get that, you know, there. and that's really cool, because it's, one, it's integrated in his swing, but also you're using it to sort of frame the negative space, and, uh, you know, and it's, you know, it's really almost acting like this bullseye to sort of pull you through this piece and show you what to really look at mm -hmm. in some ways. I mean, because that seems, that sounds dumb, but, you know, when I say it like that, but, I mean, that's what good design, you know, well-designed illustration does, is it tells you where to look. You know, it sort of drags your eye across the space instead of just kind of, you know, hitting it, hitting you with it all at once. And I think it's, uh, you know, worth pointing out that this is done really well. You know, it is, I mean, as amazing as Atari Golf is, like, you know, this really captures some real <laughs> energy. Um, and I love that game. It's horribly hard in some ways. It's a great game. Cool. Uh, okay, let's talk about, so Haunted House. Let me, I want to jump forward. So now this is what people saw on the box and the label for Haunted House when it was released. But this is not the original illustration, right? No. That actually was the illustration that was planned for the inside of the little instruction booklet. We started getting real fancy with our little booklets. And rather than just going right into instructions, we actually put together little storylines. We had a creative team, creative writers that put together these really fun storylines. And so we would have a little caption illustration. Well, that one with the bats and the close-up of the oogly eyes and the spider, that was for that position in the structure booklet. This is what was planned for the cover. But, but it was approved by my Mike Moon and it was on my drafting table. Um, and when I say drafting table, these are tables that we use for art that I can put straight up and down. And, you know, they're a lot different than just a regular drafting table. But in any event, um, I won't say her name, but she was kind of a schmo. And she was walking down the hall from Executive Row, and she stopped and looked at my office and said, that's not getting published, is it? I said, why? Mike just approved it. He goes, no, I don't think so. And I'm not, that's not happening while I'm here. And she said, look at where his eyes are. I said, what? I never even thought of that. Come on. It's definitely not anatomically correct. What are you talking about? So that's the... That is sort of the danger with doing montages. Sometimes people see things that, as the illustrator, I didn't, that's not how I planned it. But uh, in any event, I thought this was super cool, but it was banned. So it never officially was printed on the cover. <laughs> so that's cool. We get to you know, bring this back and you know, we have it in the book, which is really fun. This is a great piece. And I think it really captures that sort of like locked in the rooms you know, sort of vibe, you've got the person, you know, silhouetted in the room. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got the eyes, which is like the big part of that game, right? You know, I mean, that's, a, that's probably the scariest Atari 2600 game that there is. You know, besides, <laughs> yeah, E.T. maybe. But like, you know, like, but, you know, scary in terms of just intentionally so. Like, you know, and it's, it, it's that darkness. And again, it's you putting yourself in that place of what is it like to walk around in a pitch black room. And I think that's really captured here. You know, and you can see, and, all these lines, so this is what you're talking about when you talk about putting down this layer of gesso. The gesso, time, yeah. Right? So, and that is planned because I have my final sketch, which I project. Um, I know where I'm going to want you know, some of the alignments to happen. Um, sometimes, some of the other pieces I would do would be a lot more involved, um, but these are a little more generic. Alright, so and then this is the other one, right? You're still carrying over the eye, you know, the eyes. So that does, you know, make right. it into this. You know, great spider. That was models. another co-worker's name was Jim. I think it was a great, great model. He used to model a lot of different stuff. Alright, so steeplechase, and this was, I forget this ended up being... There was a, a couple steeplechases. Right, but this didn't end up going on the Sears one, right? Because steeplechase was a Sears exclusive game, like, and it wasn't... Yeah, it was Atari proper to release it. it was for Sears, but I can't remember if this actually made it onto that box or not. Yeah, I forget which one this got used on because I actually did two steeplechase illustrations and um, the one, this really isn't steeplechase. This is, you know, horse racing. Really horse racing. Um, the other one I did that was actually steeplechase, um, I had a friend at work who did steeplechase, and I took pictures of her and her horse, and you know, 
it's like the real thing. Um, and this one was more, you know, a compilation. I used one of our engineers. I actually went up to Bay Meadows Raceway and borrowed one of their caps and goggles for the day. Hey, can I borrow this? We're working on, you know, working at Atari, you get the opportunity to throw the name around a lot and you get things that you might not normally get in terms of favors. So he let me borrow it for the day. It's like, awesome. So he's at, you know, so it's a real, a real thing. I wanted that authenticity. Even though, I mean, come on, I think it's a little tiny illustration. Who's going to care? But that's the kind of uh, passion we had for making each each piece, you know, work of art, and it was standalone. That's awesome. Well, I, we have, what, three minutes, right? Do I, am I right on that? So let's do questions if people want. People have questions for Steve? Sure. Talk loud, please. Okay. Um, so a lot of the art that you'd see on the floor here or just in general, um, like on Twitter, anything like that, uh, you see a lot of retro art, but it's more of an 8-bit style or 16-bit pixel art. Um, and art like this seems to have a higher barrier for younger people to get into. Do you feel like technology can kind of bring future generations along to kind of meld with what you have going on to iterate off of it? Because again, we don't see a lot of that anymore, but do you think technology can help bring that back? I think so, yeah, I do. Um, the challenge today is not as large a challenge in terms of, you know, um, communicating the gameplay um, as it was back then. Um, so there's kind of different um, justification for the kind of art that was created at that time. Um, you can take a screen capture of the gameplay today and it's like unbelievable, <laughs> you know, it's final art. Um, and uh, gives people, you know, really good impression of what, what the game's all about. I mean, does that kind of answer? Well, just, um, yeah. it just I, I, I guess I would say more fan art. Mm -hmm. what, people, what people create on their own. Uh, it seems like anyone can buy a, a $120 walking tablet and, and start doing graphic design and those kind of things where some of the techniques that you're doing will take, you know, lots of skill and lots of practice, lots of time, and you're not seeing that as much. And I'm just wondering, maybe the technology that we have paired with the skills that you have that, that you've cultivated over your lifetime could kind of bring some of that art back to the current space. Because you go out on the floor, you won't find much of that. Yeah. You'll see lots of other things. Yeah, I, I think I get a little better idea of what you're, what you're driving at. I, th I think what we did was like I said, there's more accidental stuff. It's stuff you can't really program. Um, at least I haven't seen it. I've, I've seen the programs that you can make it look like, you know, uh, uh, watercolor. You take a photograph and make it look like it's watercolor. There's a lot of cool things you can do, but um, I don't know if you could actually recreate some of the nuances that we were able to do. Because, like I said, some of them were accidents, happy accidents. Stuff gets thrown away. That was not a happy accident. That was an ugly accident. So you, you know, a lot of times you had to start over because it didn't work out the way you thought it would. There's no control Z. Exactly. So with, you know, digital, it's it's different. So the tools are different, but I mean, like fundamentally, if you can draw really well, if you can render what you, your eye can see, you can still do great work. I mean, the tools. Oh are yeah. Different. yeah. But I mean, like that, like no technology is going to replace that, right? You know, it's just, I mean, that is. I think there's a lot of stuff that you can do today that would simulate it in a pretty, pretty effective way. No one else would do it. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Else? Yeah. yeah. Uh, out of all of the illustrations that you did, do you have a favorite? Um. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's Tim's favorite. <laughs> that, that's Tim's. Um, I, I think Defenders probably. One of my favorites, um, but this is Jim Heather. He's the designer of this game, uh, Warlords. He and I have kept in touch. He used to live in Santa Cruz area, close to where I live in the Santa Cruz mountains, and um, I really like this one as well. And the uh, um, inside of the, the cartridge, um, 
instruction manual has that montage of the family, which is really fun. One more. Then yeah. I just actually I just wanted a favor. Could you go back to the Othello one? It's a small detail. I really uh -huh. like how the squares, some of the squares on the right extend past the border. Oh yeah. I want to get a picture of you, of you two with that. <laughs> 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 All, right. All right, well, thank you guys very much. We're going to be doing a signing over the ground control booth in uh, 15 minutes. And Steve will be happy to talk your ear off a lot more about all this stuff. Um, so thank you. Thank you.